And I want to thank all of you for being here this morning. And of course, really grateful to have my grandson Alex here. And so really appreciate him being with us. And I hope and pray that uh, our pastor Tony is having a great time out there in Florida. Suffering for the Lord Jesus, amen. And uh, looking forward to having him back and seeing him again and fellowshipping with him. And our brother Tom, thank you so much for being a blessing to us and teaching Sunday school and all that. So we do appreciate that. Leviticus chapter number 23 is where we're going to be at. Leviticus 23, looking at verses 15 and 16. You're probably wondering, August, what is that? <laughs> Can someone try to pronounce it? It's in English. Lag Baomer. Say that. Lag Baomer. It's the counting of the Omer. What's an Omer? In the Bible. Well, look with me in Leviticus 23. And we're going to look at verses 15 and 16. Leviticus 23, 15 and 16. It says this. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. How many Sabbaths? Seven. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number. Now circle this. How many days? Five, zero. Fifty. Keep that number in mind, please. Fifty. Fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here in your house to worship you. Thank you so much, Lord, for our church family. Thank you so much, dear Lord, for Pastor Tony. Thank you, Lord, for these brethren and those that are here this morning. Father, it is my prayer that as I uh, preach this message that you would help me, guide me, direct me, and use me, Lord, as your vessel to minister to your people in your house this morning. I'm also asking, Lord, that you be with those that are watching via live stream right now and asking that the Holy Spirit of God would have his will and his way this morning. And, Lord, it is my prayer that if there is someone here at East Bay Baptist Church and they don't have that assurance of going to heaven when they die, I'm asking, Lord, that the Spirit of God would convict that they would call upon the name of the Lord and be born again through the Spirit of God. So, Father, I pray that you would help us uh, this morning. And we ask now, Father, that your grace and your will be done today. Lord, thank you for my grandson Alex being here. Thank you, Lord, for all the people being here. And we thank you for what you're about to do now. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said... Well, Jews in Israel and around the world celebrate the counting of the Omer on the 33rd day of the Omer. Well, what's an Omer? Why call it Lag, L-A-G, Ba Omer? There's a reason why Jews call it Lag Ba Omer, and it is connected to what we just read. Leviticus 23, 15, and 16. It's simply counting the Omer. Now, Jews call it Lag Baoma, the 33rd day of the Omer. The Omer in Scripture is nothing more than a wave offering. That's what it was. They would take an Omer, they would lift it up, maybe in a little vase or something, and they would wave it before the Lord. Some believe in the sign of a what? In the sign of the cross. To give thanks to God for providing all this grain, for providing all this food. And Omer in Scripture is a wave offering, a sheaf of the grain. The counting of the Omer would be between first fruits and Shavuot. Now that's Hebrew, Shavuot. Shavuot in Scripture is what? Oh, we lost our, we lost it. It's coming up, it's coming up. Shavuot 
in Scripture is called Feast of Weeks. But you better know it in the Greek as what? Thank you. Pentecost. Pentecost means what number? Thank you. You're paying attention. Pentecost means 50. So we see a, a connection here. The counting of the Omer would be between first fruits and Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. The Jews would count how many Sabbaths? Seven Sabbaths or 49 days. And then they would celebrate a new feast on the, on the morrow. Let's read it again. Verse 15. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after seven Sabbaths shall ye number fifty, fifty days. And he shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. On the 50th day, they would observe the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. They would offer a new offering unto the Lord, the grain harvest, if you will. We know according to rabbinic tradition, Moses received the oral law on Pentecost. In addition to the written law, according to Rabbinic tradition. Now, we know he received the written law, amen? But tradition says he received the oral law as well. And the rabbis told us that over the centuries, the oral law was carried by memory for years and years and years and centuries until it was finally written down at around 500 A.D. by a rabbi by the name of Rabbi Judah Hanissi or Rabbi Judah the Prince. And all these oral laws were penned down in what is called today the Talmud. May I say to all of you here this morning, the Talmud is not the Bible. When I fly LL Airlines to go to Israel, I see all these rabbis, they read, they study, and they study, and they study, and they study. But it's not the Word of God. It's Talmud. That's it. The Talmud that consists of the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Mishnah, a commentary on the Torah, the five books of Moses. The Gemara, a commentary on the Mishnah, which is a commentary on the Torah. It's all about tradition, tradition, tradition. First slide, please. Here we go. Now, we celebrate on the third, well, not us, but they do. They celebrate on the 33rd day rather than on the 50th day as prescribed in the word of God. The reason it's called Lag by Omer is because, can anybody identify that Hebrew letter? Lamed. Has a L, 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 L sound. Lamed. Lag, right? Now, Lamed is the 12th letter in the Hebrew Alphabet and Lamed has a numerical value of 30. Now, next slide, please. Can anyone identify that Hebrew letter? Gimel has a G sound, right? Gimel has a numerical value of? So if I combine Lamed, Gimel, what do I have? The 33rd day of the counting of the Omer. Thus, Lag Ba'omer. Lag Ba'omer, the counting of the Omer. Now, there was a terrible tragedy last year. Go to the next one, please. This was awful. In 2021, on Lag Ba'omer, 45 Jewish men were crushed to death. 150 per at a mass Lag Ba'omer event on Mount Merom. They have these big bonfires. They dance around the bonfires. They got into a frenzy, trampled over each other, crushed each other. Well, I mean, we're not talking about those 45. We're talking men and boys crushed over this event, Lag Ba'omer. Go to the next one, please. Mount Merom, 
is located, it's a beautiful mountain, it's located in the upper Galilee in northern Israel. And this year, the Israeli government is reinforcing the structures and is limiting entry to avoid another disaster on that very mountain. It's in a beautiful area in the Galilee, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, for that matter. The Feast of Pentecost, as we know, occurred 50 days after first fruits and was regarded by the rabbis as the, the complement or the conclusion of the Passover celebration. Now, we know as Christians, Jesus was crucified on Passover, buried on unleavened bread, rose from the dead on first fruits, sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, 50 days after his ascension back into heaven. Go with me to Deuteronomy 16, please. I want to show you something. Deuteronomy chapter number 16. There is always a connection, amen? Deuteronomy 16, we'll look at verses 9 through 12. Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 12. 12. And the word of God says this, Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 12. Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such a time as thou beginnest to put the, circle this word right here, this is interesting, sickle. You might want to keep that word in mind, sickle. The sickle to the corn or the grain. And thou shalt keep the what? There it is, Pentecost, Shavuot, the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God, with a tribute of a free will offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant, and thy maidservant, and the Levite that is within thy gate, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow that are among you in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. What city has God chosen to place his name? Jerusalem, Second Chronicles 6, 6. Look at verse 12. And thou shalt remember that thou was a bondman in Egypt or slave in Egypt, and thou shalt observe and do these statutes. So God instructed the Jewish people to number these seven weeks <clears throat> as they begin to harvest the grain. For seven weeks, they harvest that grain. And on the 50th day, they would present that grain harvest as a wave of a sheaf of an omer to the Lord thy God and giving thanks to the Lord God of Israel for the abundance of food, for the abundance of grain. Time of rejoicing before the Lord in the place where he would place his name forever. Not only the land of Israel, but the city of Jerusalem. God said you are to observe and keep these feasts as a memorial throughout all your generations. Next slide, please. Notice Numbers 28, 26. Also in the day of the here it is. First fruits, when ye bring a new meat offering unto the Lord after your weeks be out or complete, seven Sabbaths, 49 days, ye shall have an holy convocation, and ye shall do no servile work. Damn it. Do you know what we're having right now this morning? We are having a holy convocation a holy gathering of God's people. Is that what we're doing right now? In his house. After the count of the 49 days or seven weeks, there will be a, a holy convocation. A convocation is nothing more than a summon assembly, a gathering of God's people. Next slide, please. <laughs> Here we are. At church, we have a holy convocation of believers gathered together, there's our pastor, 
to worship the one true God. Amen? We worship the God of Israel. We worship the God of the Jews. When God's people gather together, it is a, right now, a holy convocation. And I noticed that when I was putting this picture up, I had no idea that there is a late departed brother. That's right. There he is right there. We see that 50 days after Jesus ascended back to heaven from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, he sent the promise of the Father. Did he not? He sent the Holy Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. The birth and the beginning of the church. Acts chapter number 2. Let's go there. Let's go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 2. Now may I submit to all of you this morning Acts chapter 2 was not the founding of the Pentecostal denomination. May I just say that, okay? That's false doctrine. Notice Acts chapter 2, looking at verse number 1. And when the day of Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, 50 days, Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord, not a Honda accord. <laughs> one, <laughs> one accord in one place. We're all in one accord, are we not? We are all in one place. We are all in one holy convocation here. And suddenly there came a sound of, from heaven as a, of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, dialects, different languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And yet, when you look, drop down to verse 41. You know what happened on the day of Pentecost? Oh, my stars. Look at verse 41. How many Jews got saved? Look at this. Acts 2, 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them how many Jews? Wow! 3,000 Jewish souls came to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior. You want to know what's interesting? I see a parallel here. In Exodus chapter 32 and verse 28, 3,000 Jewish souls perished at Mount Sinai. For what? Sin. Rebellion. Disobeying the Lord, right? But when we read Acts 2.41, 3,000 Jewish souls get saved. Born again through the Spirit of God. And that reminds me, go to the next slide, please. That reminds me of this passage right here. I love it. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter or law, but of the what? Look at this. For the letter, but the you see the You see the differentiation here? 3,000 Jewish souls die on Mount Sinai. 3,000 get saved at Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem. Now, we know on Pentecost there was a great harvest, not of grain, but of souls. Do you see the connection? A harvest of souls. But in the future, I see another grain harvest. According to Bible prophecy, there will be another grain harvest of eschatological proportions in the book of Revelation. Now, let's go to Revelation 14. Revelation chapter number 14. Revelation 14. Notice with me, please, in verse number 14. We'll read verses 14 through 20. Book of Revelation, 
chapter 14, beginning in verse number 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto who? Ben Adam in Hebrew, the son of man. That's Jesus. Having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a what? Did you not read about a sharp sickle earlier? Remember I told you to keep that word in mind? Here it is right here. It's right here. Now, verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap for what? Here it is again. Harvest the grain, the harvest of the earth is right. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped or harvested. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the alt out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden or stomped without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horses' bridles, by the space, of a thousand six hundred furlongs. We see two harvests here. From verses 14 through 16, that is a grain harvest. Grain harvest. Write that down. A grain harvest. 14 through 16. Verses 17 through 20 is a grape harvest. You see the differentiation there? Verses 14 through 16, a grain harvest. Verses 17 through 20, a grape harvest. What is this harvest all about? This harvest is the wrath of God. That's what it is. The grain harvest, the grape harvest. It's all the wrath of God. People think there's no such thing as the wrath of God. They are mistaken. The wrath of God is coming, ladies and gentlemen. Make no mistake about it. Amen? The judgment of God is indeed coming. Go to the next slide, please. Now, we know the Lord Jesus, he has a crown, right? He has a crown showing authority as ruler of the universe. And the sickle representing judgment, the wrath of God. A sickle typically is used for harvesting, reaping, cutting grain, crops, or succulent forage. And you see in that picture right there, the Lord Jesus has a sickle in his hand. He's going to cut that grain representing the nations of the world. And he's going to do something with that harvest. Jesus thrust in the sickle into the earth to judge all the nations. To reap and harvest the earth is to judge and punish its people for their sin and their rebellion against none other than God himself. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, if you come to Israel with me in the fall, I'm going to take you to Jerusalem, to the garden tomb, the site of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. I'm going to point this out to you when we're over there. You know what you're looking at? A 2,000-year-old wine vat. Back in the day, they would throw all the grapes in there, and then what would they do? And then Right over here, you can see a little trench where that juice would come right out, and it would go into 
stone pots. That is 2,000 years old. At the site of the garden tomb in Jerusalem, the site of his resurrection, the Bible tells us in verses 17 through 20 that the Lord God is going to take the nations like a cluster of grapes, cut them, throw them into a wine vat, and then what is he going to do to those nations? going to stomp them so bad. And notice again in verses 17 through 20. Actually, look at verse 20 for sake of time here. Actually, look at verse 19. <laughs> and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the what? The wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden or stamped without the city outside the city of Jerusalem, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. Whoa. Okay. What what is a furlong in the Bible? A cubit is how many inches? From the elbow, tip of the finger, eighteen. What's a reed? Ten feet. What's a furlong? 606 feet, 9 inches, about one-eighth of a mile. When he stomps those nations in the wine vat, the wine vat representing Europe, the grapes, the cluster of grapes representing the nations, he's going to stomp those grapes, and that blood is going to flow, man. And it's going to flow, and it's going to flow, and it's going to flow. It's going to be as high as what? What's that about? Four and a half? Five feet? That's a lot of blood. And I take that to be literal. Next slide, please. So I did a little comparison right here. My tour group and I were just here three weeks ago. Petra. To the left is the Jezreel Valley in northern Israel also known in Revelation 16:16 16, 16 as Megiddo, Armageddon, Armageddon. To the right, we have the rose-red colored city of Petra, one of the seven wonders of the world, the future hiding place for the Jewish people. All the nations are going to gather right here at Armageddon. The Bible says he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Har Megiddo or Armageddon. Those nations will march south to Jerusalem where God will meet them head on and destroy them. That battle will make its way all the way up to where they met originally, the Jezreel Valley, Armageddon, and then that blood will flow for 1,600 furlongs. What is that in modern vernacular? About 176 miles. That blood will flow for 176 miles, ending up where? At Petra. Why at Petra? What's going on at Petra? That's where the Jews will be held up for the last half of the tribulation period. Let me show you something here. Let's go to Isaiah 63. Again, parallel is very important. You always compare Scripture with Scripture. Amen? Look with me in um, Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. We're going to have verses 1 through 6. Isaiah 63, 1 through 6. And I'll read. Who is this that cometh from where? That's where Petra is, Edom. That's where the Jews are going to be held up for the last half of the tribulation. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from where? The capital of Edom. This that is glorious in his apparel, 
traveling in the greatness of his strength. I, that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou what? Our Lord is covered in blood. Covered in blood. He's red in thine apparel, verse 2, and thy garments like him that treadeth the what? The wine fat or the wine vat. No wonder Revelation 19, 13 tells us, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. He's covered in blood, the blood of his enemies. Verse 3, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people that was not with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. If you look at that Jezreel Valley right there, that can hold a whole lot of armies, man. For the sake of argument here. According to the United Nothing, and that's what they are, there are 192 nations in the world today. Let's say for the sake of argument. 100 nations invade the Jezreel Valley. Those 100, 100 nations can produce 1 million soldiers apiece. 100 million soldiers. Did you know 100 million soldiers slain can produce 600 million quarts of blood. That's 50 quarts per foot for 176 miles. It's awful. A lot of blood. His raiment is stained with this blood. Jesus will crush the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron, right? Revelation 12, 4. He will reign as king of kings and lord of lords and establish his kingdom from Jerusalem. His divine government will overthrow the governments of the world. Well, that sounds like treason. Call it what you will. The coming government of Jesus Christ will overthrow the governments of this world, including this government. All the governments of the world will be overthrown. Revelation 11, 15. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. He was crucified on Passover, buried on unleavened bread, rose from the dead on first fruits, sent the Holy Spirit 50 days later. Pentecost. Four feasts already fulfilled, right? Three that are yet to be fulfilled. Up next, trumpets. Followed by Day of Atonement. Followed by Feast of Tabernacles. Trumpets, two phases. The rapture, second coming. Two trumpets will sound. One for the church, one for Israel. Day of Atonement, he builds the temple of the Lord. Feast of Tabernacles, the 1,000 year kingdom reign of Jesus, the Messiah. You see how it all connects, folks? It's not August. It all connects. It's in the word of God. So when they are celebrating this Lad Baomer on the 33rd day rather than the 50th day with all these celebrations on the way, Folks, it reminds me that Bible prophecy will be fulfilled. Listen to me. There's another harvest coming. This time it's going to be a harvest of wrath. The harvest of the wrath of God when he judges this wicked, sinful world. Final slide, please. Up next, on God's prophetic calendar. And I think you know what it is. The rapture of the church of the living God.
God. And may I submit to all of you here, that event is dateless, signless. No one knows the day. We were just talking about this. No one knows the day. And no one knows the hour. Imminent. Imminency. It's hanging over our head, ready to overtake us. Ask yourself this question. What if the rapture was to happen right now? Would this congregation be empty? Or would some of you still be sitting in your seats after the rapture? Are you going to meet him in the air? Or will you be left behind? My advice to you, and Brother Tom can reiterate, you don't want to be left behind. I wouldn't want my worst enemy If you're not saved, here's the bad news. You're either one trumpet sound away from being left behind one heartbeat away from going to hell. What will you do with the Lord Jesus today? That trumpet could sound at any moment. And if you're not ready this morning, get ready. Everything seems to be falling into place. We are so very close to that event right there. You don't want to be left behind. That shofar, again, everyone say shofar. Shofar, so good. That shofar is going to sound could even be today. Come up, Heather! Amen. Woo! Faster than you can blink that eye. We're gone. Tom, how'd you put the uh, blinking of the eye thing again? Do you remember that? How, to, how was that again? A twinkle! Tell me the rapture is going to be faster than that? Absolutely. And those of us who know the Lord Jesus as personal Savior, we're gone. We're out of here. Those not saved, left behind. To go through what? Seven year period. Every head bowed, every eye closed. For a brief moment, I hope you come back tonight. You know why? I'm going to talk about UFOs. What? UFOs? What does that have to do with Bible prophecy? Come back tonight. But with every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're sitting here this morning, you're saying, August, I don't have the assurance of going to heaven when I die. I don't want to go to hell for the rest of eternity. I don't want to be left behind. But I know I need to be saved. August, would you pray for me that I would get saved this morning? Not religion, relationship Amen. with the Lord Jesus. And if I'm talking to you this morning, all you simply need to do is slip your hands up and put it down. By doing that, all you're telling me is this. August, pray for me. I need to get saved. I need to get saved. Do we have anyone like that here this morning? Come on, you're at the right place at the right time. Don't squander this. Don't walk out of here lost. Because you and I are not promised tomorrow. We're not. I don't care if you're young, your whole life's ahead of you, middle-aged, old, we are not promised tomorrow. Death could come at any time to each and every one of us. Like the old hymn song would say, death beds are coming, coming for you and for me. 
what will you do with Jesus Christ this morning? August, pray for me. I need to be saved. If that's you, slip your hand up and put it down. Right, let me ask you this then. If you are saved, born again, washed by the blood of the Lord, sealed unto the day of redemption, if you're saved this morning, let me see your hand. August, I'm saved, and I know it. Okay. Okay, quite a few hands up there. You can put them down. Thank you. If you could not raise your hand in the affirmative, you need to talk to me this morning. Brother Tom, myself, ladies, one of the other ladies, don't walk out of here lost, please. Don't. Get saved this morning. Father, as we have this time of invitation, as the piano starts playing, Father, I'm asking you. I know we took a lot of information in this morning, Lord. Heavenly Father, I'm asking you now that the Holy Spirit of God would have his will and his way this morning. Speak to us, Lord. There's got to be someone here, Lord. They don't have that relationship with the Lord Jesus as Savior. Which means, instead of Jesus being their Savior today, he will be their judge tomorrow. Instead of saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord, one day the Lord will say, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. God in heaven, I pray right now, Lord, please speak to us. Speak to these that are here, those watching live stream, but especially, Lord, those here under my voice this morning, they don't have that assurance, Lord, in heaven when they die. I'm going to be up here, ready to talk with anybody. Father, thank you for what you're about to do now. In Jesus' name we pray.